let's go on to Canto. Four, which is the description of limbo. So the heavy sleep within my head was smashed by an enormous thunderclap, so that I started up as one whom force awakens. So Dante awakens and he finds himself on the edge of an abyss. An abyss, a very deep valley, right, or hole. Mm -hmm. So he finds himself on the edge of the cone-shaped Oh, okay. And uh, the valley dark and deep and filled with mist is such that as I gazed into its pit, I was unable to discern a thing. You've got to remember, Dante reminds you, but, but you also have to force yourself to remember, it's very dark down there, very little light. You know, Milton has this nice oxymoron, darkness, visible seeming contradiction. How can darkness be visible? That's how he describes the situation in his hell, as darkness visible. So it's very dark. Let us design, uh, descend into the blind world now. Nel cieco mondo. Why is it blind? Because it's very difficult to see. Also morally blind, right? There's, a, there's one of those phrases that has both a literal and a uh, symbolic or allegorical significance. It's a blind world because the people there are blind or are blind and were blind to the good. Let us descend into the blind world now, the poet whose deathly pale began. I shall go first and you shall follow me. But I, who had seen the change in his complexion, color of his face, said, how shall I go if you are frightened, you who have always helped dispel my doubts? And he to me, the anguish of the people whose place is here below has touched my face with that compassion you mistake for fear. Let us go on. The way that waits is long. So if you're thinking about this idea of the fact that Dante, the fictional narrator, the pilgrim, shows pity for the souls of the damned, here's Virgil also showing pity, not for all the souls, but at least for those souls of whom he is a member. Can't say it. The group of souls of whom he is a member, right? So he shows pity, and yet he constantly rebukes Dante for showing pity for the other sinners. So it's like Dante, and I'm talking here about Dante the author, mm -hmm. is pointing out how difficult it is for us, not only for Dante the pilgrim and Virgil, mm -hmm. but for the readers not to have pity for people or souls here who are suffering. Even Virgil uh, has compassion for the souls in limbo. Dante goes on to describe then the situation. Here, for as much as hearing could discover, there was no outcry louder than the sighs that caused the everlasting air to tremble. The sighs arose from sorrows without torment. Out of the crowds, the many multitudes of infants, and of women, and of men. So infants, that's the only group that traditional medieval theology would have placed in limbo. Unbaptized infants, like if you're born and you immediately die, and you don't have time to receive baptism. Uh, the church uh, theologians thought, well, it's unfair that those poor little babies would end up in hell, but they can't go to heaven. Why? We'll talk about this. You have to be baptized. That's how you're cleansed from original sin. Really strange idea. So they thought there must be a place, not in hell, not in heaven, for these poor unbaptized infants. That's the infants. They also thought that the great uh, heroes of the Old Testament, Adam and, and uh, Abel and Moses, the great prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, they can't be in hell. They can't be in hell. They had a faith in the coming of the Messiah. And so they have to be in heaven. How does that happen? Christ, after he dies, goes down to hell and takes them out. That's called the harrowing of hell. We'll talk about it. And takes them to heaven. So the original readers would be saying, yeah, infants, and of women and of men, who's this? 
There shouldn't be any women and men left in limbo. They should all be in heaven. Now, Dante has another group, which is very not uh, orthodox, very unorthodox, very uh, uh, counter to uh, the teachings of the church at his time. He puts the virtuous men and women of the ancient world in this limbo along with the unbaptized infants. The kindly master asked, said, do you not ask who are these spirits whom you see before you? So there's a typical professor-student situation too. You know? <laughs> Why don't you ask some questions? You have no intellectual curiosity. And then when you try to ask a question, I'm coming to that later in the lecture. So you don't know what to do. But here, you know, Dante's already been slapped down for asking a question. And then Virgil says, why don't you ask who these people are? I'd have you know before you go ahead, they did not sin. And yet, though they have merits, that's not enough because they lacked baptism, the portal of the faith that you embrace. And if they lived before Christianity, they did not worship God in fitting ways. And of such spirits, I myself am one. For these defects and for no other evil, we now are lost and punished just with this. We have no hope, and yet we live in longing. So there's a situation of the souls of the, uh, of the great heroes and wise men and benefactors of the ancient world that Dante puts in his limbo. They have desire, but no hope. Why do they have desire? Because they saw the harrowing of hell. They saw Christ come down and take those souls out. They know there's something more, and they know they can't have it. You know, it's like a Chinese, when we were first in China in 84, 85, everybody wanted to watch a bicycle, a sewing machine. They were happy, right? Now you get a peasant living uh, in the countryside. He sees Beijing. Everybody's got a car, a condo, you know, a, 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 what do they call these things? A, what do they call those things, the iPads, you know, and all of a sudden they're really discontent. They were happy, but now they're discontent. So what we'll find is that the souls in Dante's limbo, uh, souls of uh, uh, people that lived before the time of Christ, they get a very nice afterlife. I'm sure any of us would be very happy there. But they don't have ecstasy. They don't have uh, what the Christians have. Uh, and they know about this. They know they're lacking something. Our punishment is we have no hope, and yet we live in longing, in desire. Great sorrow seized my heart on hearing him, for I had seen some estimable men among those souls suspended in that limbo. Now, I know some of you are translation students. If you look over to the Italian, gente. That's people, Right? So you've got a really strange situation here where a medieval author in a patriarchal society than which there is no more patriarchal society uses inclusive language. There are people, worthy people there, and then the 20th century translator makes it sexist. There are men. There are men. Actually, Dante meets more women in this part of hell than in any other part of hell. They're not all men. Tell me, my master, tell me, Lord. Notice how Dante, again, it's so subtle, you have to really read carefully. You know, Virgil has just said, you know, I've been exiled from God, and I'm being punished by being in this limbo. And then Dante says, Master, Lord, you know, it sort of flatters him, sort of, you know, indicates, you know, no matter, you know, you're down here, it's unfortunate, you know, uh, you're still my master, you're still my Lord, I still respect you, see. Tell me, Master, tell me, Lord, I then began, because I wanted to be certain of that belief which vanquishes all errors. Did, ever, did any ever go by his own merit or others from this place towards blessedness? So now Dante asks about the harrowing of hell, because he knows Virgil was there at the time that Christ died, because Virgil died before the time of Christ. And he says, you know, has anybody ever got out of limbo? Was there any uh, escape? from this place. And he who understood my covert speech, the fact that I was asking something hidden, mm -hmm. replied, I was new entered on this state. Well, if you work out the math, 53 years, 53 years 
after Virgil died, Christ died. When I beheld a great Lord. You look over at the, at the Italian, it's even more vague. Un possente, a powerful one, a powerful one. See, Virgil doesn't know who this is. He just knows it's a very powerful, uh, a very powerful uh, 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 spirit. When I beheld a great Lord enter here, the crown he wore, a sign of victory. So Christ has the, uh, has the crown of thorns, but now it's a sign of victory rather than a sign of punishment. He carried off the shade of our first father, Adam, his son Abel, but not Cain, right? Not Cain. Cain is in the depths of hell because he murdered his brother. And the shade of Noah, of Moses, the obedient legislator. I like that. Moses, you know, brought the Ten Commandments, so he's called a, a person that brings the law, a legislator. Of Father Abraham, David the king of Israel, it's another name for Jacob, his father, <coughs> uh, and his sons. And Rachel, she for whom he, that is Jacob, worked so long, and many others, and he made them blessed. And I should have you know that before them there were no human souls that had been saved. So that's in that diagram in the lecture, if you look at it. You know, here, is the, here is the period of human history when uh, the first man and the first woman were in paradise. Here is the birth of Christ thousands of years later. Not anyone during that long period got into heaven, right? So before, uh, before uh, them, there were no human souls that had been saved. We did not stay our steps, although he spoke. We still continued onward through the wood, the wood, I say, where many spirits thronged. Our path had not gone far beyond the point where I had slept when I beheld a fire win out against a hemisphere of shadow. We still were a little distance from it, but not so far I could not see in part that honorable men, and again, gente, possessed that place. So it's very much like the situation in uh, Book 6 of the Aeneid, where when Aeneas and uh, Sybil, his, his guide is a priestess of Apollo, uh, they enter the underworld, they pass the river Acheron, and there's just a kind of, uh, kind of a mass of people, and that's where he meets, for example, Dido, his old, uh, his old lover. Uh, but then they get to a point where there's a parting of the ways. And one part, one path goes to Elysium, and the other path goes to Tartarus. So Dante, too, he has in hell, he has a, a sort of area for, you know, just uh, 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 people who were, were uh, you know, not particularly uh, good, but not particularly bad. And, of course, the unbaptized infants, what are you going to do? I mean, this must have been one of the things. He thought, well, I've got to write about limbo. I'm going to be writing about a journey to hell. I've got to write about limbo, but... These babies, you know, what are they going to have to say? They got nothing to say. They can't talk, for one thing, and they have had no experience of any kind. And so, you know, he just ignores them. He says infants, and then he immediately goes on to this other class of souls, which are the virtuous, uh, the virtuous pagans. Of course, like Virgil as well, this is just one part of hell. Another part of hell for Dante, Tartarus. That's where the evil souls are punished in Virgil's afterlife, that corresponds to the actual uh, depths of hell in Dante's vision. So again, he's very closely, he's adapting, but, uh, but still very closely following the structure of Virgil's afterworld in this part of the comedy. O you who honor art and science both, who are these souls whose dignity has kept their way of being separate from the rest? So Dante has learned his lesson, you know, Virgil, Virgil wants him to ask about these souls. So he asks the question, who are these souls? And he to me, the honor of their name, which echoes up above within your life, gains heaven's grace. And that advances them. So they have achieved a certain fame. They have achieved uh, a name, right? Uh, through their deeds in their life. And this has given them a kind of special place in limbo. Meanwhile, there was a voice that I could hear. Pay honor to the estimable poet. His shadow, which has left us, now returns. So that's the pay honor to the estimable poet. Remember, that's the inscription on the uh, memorial to Dante in the Santa Croce in Florence. 
to choose this line, pay, uh, pay uh, honor to the uh, noble poet, to the estimable poet. So uh, after that voice was done, when there was silence, I saw four giant shades approaching us. In aspect, they were neither sad nor joyous. So now, out of the hemisphere of light, this place which is within the darkness of limbo, but more pleasant, he sees four uh, souls coming towards, uh, towards them. And uh, they say, welcome, pay honor to the estimable poet, his shadow which has left us now returns. One of the things you think about, if you think about this a lot, is they may be surprised that Virgil is coming back. Because the last time somebody left, they didn't come back. But poor Virgil, you know, he has to come back. He's not like uh, Adam or Moses or, or, uh, or Isaiah. He can't go to heaven and stay there, right? So they said, oh, you're coming back. After the voice was done and then it was silence, I saw the four giants, shades. Giant, literally, but also giant in terms of their accomplishments. There's a kind of, we'll see in one of the illustrations here, uh, the idea the taller you are, the sort of the more noble you are. My kindly master then began by saying, Look well at him who holds the sword in hand, who moves before the other three as lord. That shade is Homer, the consummate poet. The other one is Horus, satirist. The third is Ovid. The last is Lucan. Well, Homer, for Dante, is the greatest poet, and yet Homer was not read by Dante. No original texts of Homer were available to the Middle Ages. And so Dante only knew about Homer through summaries and through uh, comments by other writers. But still, he follows the traditional idea that Homer is the greatest poet. And then Horace, most of you know who Horace is, well, author of the uh, famous uh, treatise on literature, He's studying that in your ancient literary theory class probably next week. Uh, the third is Ovid, author of the Metamorphoses. Metamorphoses is the sort of standard summary of Greek and Roman mythology. And then Lucan. Now Lucan, we don't know. Lucan was an epic poet, uh, lived, uh, lived uh, in the first century. He wrote a poem called Pharsalia about the Roman civil wars. For Dante, he was a great writer. For modern readers, um, quite minor. Because of these spirit, because each of these spirits shares with me the name, poet, called out before by the lone voice, they welcome me, and doing that, do well. So even Virgil's got a bit of pride in his own accomplishment, that they welcome me, and they're, they're, they're doing the right thing by welcoming me. And so I saw that splendid school assembled, led by the song, Lord of Song Incomparable, who, like an eagle, soars above the rest. There's a lot of interesting uh, sort of implication here. The poets have a hierarchy, right? Everything in Dante, there's no sort of democracy. There's no equality. Everything has got to be higher or lower, right? So Homer is the top poet. And then he's compo uh, compared to the eagle, who is the top bird. Just like gold is the top metal, diamond is the top stone, uh, um, the lion is the king of beasts, we still say that, the king of beasts, right? Mm -hmm. And then also literary genres have a hierarchy. Led by the Lord of Song Incomparable. What's the incomparable song? Always the epic. Right? Epic is the most noble literary form. And they're a school, you know, again, the idea of community. Even the poets have like a little organization. Later, even more charming to me, the philosophers are in a family, a philosophical family. Right? But you don't, you don't get like isolated individuals here. Soon after they had talked a while together, they turned to me saluting cordially. And having witnessed this, my master smiled. Okay, underline smiled there because there are very, very few smiles in the Inferno. This is one of the only ones. Maybe the only one. And even greater honor then was mine. For they invited me to join their ranks. I was the sixth among, among such intellects. 
<laughs> you have to laugh. I mean, the pride of Dante, you know. I was the sixth. Now, the commentators, you know, they're trying to make up for this. They're trying to explain it in some way. They say, well, you know, he wasn't really thinking of himself as Dante, the great poet. He was thinking of himself as the representative of vernacular poetry. Because all of these poets are classical poets, and he's the poet, poet of the modern world. Maybe. Or maybe he was thinking of himself as Dante, the great poet. When, he, when he's climbing the mountain of purgatory, uh, uh, he says, you know, he, he, he's worried that he'll have to spend a lot of years on the terrace that, that uh, uh, purifies pride. He knows that he's proud. proud. He knows that that's one of, his, one of his major failings. So did we move along and toward the light, talking of things about which silence here is just as seemly as our speech was there. We reached the baits of an exalted castle, encircled seven times by towering walls, defended all around by a fair stream. We forded this, walked over the stream, as if upon hard ground. I entered seven portals with these sages. We reached a meadow of green flowering plants. So the seven portals and the seven, uh, uh, the seven uh, walls probably represent the seven liberal arts, right? So this is a kind of castle that symbolizes uh, ancient culture, ancient learning. And uh, inside, there, inside the castle is really the same uh, situation that Virgil calls Elysium. The blessed fields where the virtuous souls of Virgil's Aeneid get to pass their afterlife as well. So it's like a beautiful country club. Everything you would possibly want uh, in this place within uh, the gate of hell. Just uh, have an interesting question over the break. If the, uh, if the uh, virtuous uh, pagans are in limbo, what about the sinful pagans? Well, unfortunately, they're down there. Because Dante felt, you know, if you, if you, were, if you were a murderer, uh, or if you, were, you know, if, you were, uh, if you cheated people, uh, if you seduced women, if you did any number of things that were evil, it didn't make any difference when you lived before or after Christ. You still were offending God, and you still would end up uh, separated from God. So a little later, we'll meet a character, Caponaeus, who cursed Jupiter, and he's punished for, for blasphemy, you know, for attacking God with words. <clears throat> but he's still in the Christian hell, because for Dante, that's the equivalent of cursing the Christian God to curse Jupiter because Jupiter was the supreme Roman God and so he's punished for blasphemy even though he didn't curse the Christian God and likewise you know if you murder someone that's a sin in Christian religion it's also a sin in ancient religion and so uh, the sinners will meet a lot of characters from classical uh, times in lower in hell so let's look at the categories of uh, souls here now so, uh, we reached a meadow of green flowering plants. Uh, the people here had eyes both grave and slow. Their features carried great authority. They spoke infrequently with gentle voices. Now, when I was a young professor, my first sabbatical, I went to England, to London. We lived in London. I did research at the British Museum, which is where the British Library used to be. Now it's a separate place. And the reading room of the British Museum is this huge domed room, sort of like our dome over here in the foyer of the library, a little bit bigger. It's got the light filtering down. And to work in the British Library, uh, you get a little desk, you know, a little care, and you sit there and you get your books and you do research. And all the greatest scholars from around the world are doing research there. And this, this passage it reminded me of this passage, right? Uh, the people there had eyes both grave and slow. Their features carried great authority. They spoke infrequently with gentle voices. Well, of course, gentle voices, because it was a library, right? And uh, so, <laughs> we drew aside to one part of the meadow, an open place, both high and filled with light, and we could see all those who were assembled. Facing me there on the enameled green, great-hearted souls were shown to me, 
and I still glory in my having witnessed them. So now we get a kind of catalog, right, a list of the souls that Dante saw in limbo. I saw Electra. Doesn't ring a bell right offhand. The mother of Dardanus, who was the founder of Troy. <clears throat> With her many comrades, among whom I knew Hector and Aeneas, so those should be familiar names, and Caesar, Julius, in his armor. Now, doing this thing on nakedness, I thought, ah, there. He's wearing his armor, you know. There's one soul in the afterworld that's got clothes on, or something like clothes. But then I looked over Cesare Armato. It could mean that he is armed, meaning he has a weapon, not necessarily in armor. Because remember, Homer, as a sign that he's the poet of the epic, carries a sword, right? Poet of the Iliad. Falcon-eyed. I saw Camilla. Okay, she's a character from the Aeneid. And Penthesilea, the queen of the Amazons. These are women. And on the other side saw King Latinus, who sat beside Lavinia, his daughter. I saw that Brutus who drew Tarkin out. That's not the Brutus that was involved in the killing of Caesar. Lucretia, Julia, Marcia, and Cornelia. Look at all the women, all these virtuous women, right? <clears throat> and solitary, set apart, Saladin. Now that's even more outrageous. First of all, Dante puts the souls of non-Christians in limbo, which should be reserved for the patriarchs and prophets and unbaptized infants born after the time of Christ. He puts those souls there, even puts a Muslim, Saladin, right, who was the sultan of Egypt in the 12th century. He was an enemy of the Crusaders, but they honored him because he was generous and he was, he was uh, uh, a true knight. They saw him as a kind of worthy enemy. <clears throat> when I had raised my eyes a little higher, I like that too, higher, literally, but also symbolically, because for people in the Middle Ages, the highest form of life was the contemplative life, that is a life of study, a life of knowledge, not an active life, not an, a life in politics or as a soldier. Those could be noble lives too, but the contemplative life was a more noble life than the life, uh, the active life. So I raised my eyes a little higher. I saw the master of the men who know seated in philosophic family. Well, we think the master of those who know, it's not men, it's color, it's those, the master of those who know. Who's that? Any modern philosopher would tell you Plato, of course. Plato is the father of Western philosophy. But for Dante, who didn't know Plato, only dialogue that was available to him was a Timaeus, which is a late dialogue and you know not one of the great ones. For him, the master of those who know was Aristotle, right? There all look up to him, all do him honor. There I beheld both Socrates and Plato closest to him in front of all the rest. Well, at least he got that right, right? He got, uh, Plato and Socrates are there, and they're very close to Aristotle, but they're still not the, the master of those who know. Uh, Democrates, who ascribes the world to chance, Diogenes, Empedocles, Zeno, Thales, Anaxagoras, Heraclitus. I saw the good collector of medicinals, I mean Dioscorides. I saw Orpheus and Tully, that's actually Cicero, who we think of as a rhetorician, but he also wrote philosophical works. Linus, Moral Seneca, Seneca, we think of his as a dramatist, but he also wrote philosophical works. Euclid, now we're getting away from philosophy and more into science and mathematics, right? Euclid, everybody knows Euclid. The ge a geometer, Ptolemy, the astronomer. Hippocrates, he was a physician. Galen, uh, another physician. Avicenna, now we get another Arab. Now we get another Muslim. This is an Arab uh, physician of the 11th century. And Averroes. <coughs> Averroes was a Muslim commentator on the works of Aristotle. That's how the works of Aristotle were preserved. I cannot here describe them all in full. My ample theme impels me onward so. What's told is often less than the event. 
The company of six divides in two. So now Virgil and Dante have to continue their journey, and the other four poets go back to limbo, go back to the castle. My knowing guide leads me another way into the quiet, into tr- uh, fr- beyond the quiet, into trembling air, and I have reached a part where nothing gleams. Okay, let's look at a few questions here. Christianity as an exclusivistic religion. Uh, Dante says concerning the souls in limbo, or Virgil says, yet though they have merits, that's not enough because they lack baptism, the portal of the faith that you embrace. So baptism is the ritual cleansing by water of the newborn infant, or in the case of an adult convert, uh, from original sin. So in some way, this Cleansing is made possible by Christ's suffering and death. This uh, theory of how Christ's death uh, allows human beings to be reconciled with God is called the theory of the atonement. To atone for something means to make up for it, to compensate for it. So one theory, an early theory, very crude idea, that Christ's death pays the human being's ransom uh, and releases uh, human beings from captivity by the devil. So, you know, it's like you've been abducted, and, you know, you're being held captive, and then Christ's death is a kind of payment to the devil of ransom, which allows you to go free. Well, in the later Middle Ages, this idea was thought to be too crude. Uh, you know, God dealing with the devil, paying him ransom. I mean, we don't like to do that today, right? Uh, somebody gets kidnapped, you don't want to pay ransom if you can help it. Uh, so they developed another theory. And St. Anselm was a, was a Christian theologian in the later Middle Ages. And he says Christ's death is required by divine justice as a kind of legal compensation for the crime of Adam. This is the theory that Milton subscribes to in Paradise Lost, that really it's God himself who is offended by, uh, by human sin. And God's justice requires some compensation in order to free humanity uh, from the consequences of Adam's sin. And that compensation is the death of someone who is totally innocent, who is totally uh, uh, without guilt, uh, without original sin. So it's a kind of paying of a compensation Uh, from one part of the Christian trinity to another part of the Christian trinity, from uh, God the Son to God the Father. So what about original sin? Maybe the best way to look at it is kind of a genetic defect. I've got very bad eyes. You probably noticed. You know, I had to get some thicker glasses here to read this. My text has gotten very messy. And, uh, you know, I can hardly see the text anymore. I can see the notes. They're written all over, but the text is getting hard to see. So in any case, it's a genetic effect. My mother had very bad eyes. My brother has bad eyes. Her father had bad eyes, right? So it's a a defect. It's something that I suffer from. uh, But, you know, it comes from my ancestors. It's not something that I brought about myself. So original sin results from the first man and first woman's having disobeyed God's only command in the Garden of Eden. And for medieval theology, this explains the tendency of human beings to do evil. The fact that so many people uh, do things that are against the good. From this idea of baptism as a necessary cleansing from an uh, original sin, the idea was developed that there is no salvation outside of the church. Salus extra ecclesiam non est. That's Augustine's. So you can't get into heaven unless you've been baptized, right? Very strange idea. Original sin, baptism, atonement, these ideas are strange enough to a person brought up as a Christian. I can't imagine how strange they must seem to you. For me, it's like the Buddhist idea of reincarnation. I remember uh, being in, uh, in Macau a few years ago, watching a a Hong Kong movie about uh, a love affair. Uh, This guy falls in love with this girl, but then she tragically dies. And then he receives a message that she's going to be reincarnated. And so he's very excited about this, and they set a place 
where he's going to meet her and so forth, down in central somewhere. And he's on the street and he's pacing back and forth. He, you know, the time is coming up. And he thinks to himself, I hope she's not reincarnated as a cat or a dog. You know, like just, what? You know, I couldn't believe it. But it's a possibility, right? It's a possibility. So uh, this is bizarre, really bizarre to a Christian. And of course, uh, these ideas, original sin and baptism and so forth. Here's a, a, a manuscript rumination that uh, sort of gives you the whole story in pictures. Here's Eve, uh, and here's the serpent who has a kind of human face but a snaky tail, and she's taking the fruit from the tree that they weren't supposed to eat from, God's only command, you know, do anything you want, but don't eat from that particular tree. What's the thing they do? Of course, you've got to eat from that tree. Here is, this is how the uh, Adam uh, sinned. Of course, it was Eve that tempted him, you know, the, the serpent tempted Eve, but then Eve tempts Adam, and that's where all of the uh, anti-feminism of Christian tradition comes from. And then there you see God the Father, very sort of, you know, imposing looking guy, telling them you're going to have to leave, right? And then you see them going out the door. So that's kind of nice, it just in a capsule you see all of the events of the Garden of Eden. And then here's a, uh, a uh, Renaissance painting of poor Adam and Eve being cast out. And uh, that's, the, uh, that's the archangel uh, Michael who is uh, telling them, you know, you have to leave uh, paradise, you have to leave Eden. So the exclusiv uh, exclusiv exclusivity, exclusivity of Christianity is not unique among Western religions. Judaism, in the Old Testament, or in the Hebrew Bible, I am the God, your God, and you shall have no other gods before me. Right? Very, very strong, exclusive monotheism. Islam, there is only one God, and his name is Allah. Right. So these religions don't allow for a kind of tolerance of other beliefs, at least uh, in, their, in their traditional forms. Not like Buddhism, Taoism, or Hinduism. There was a temple in Macau, the Amma Temple. That's where, that's where Macau got its name. Uh, the Portuguese came sailing up and they said, what's this place called? And that, they were, the temple was there. And they said, Amagao, Ama Temple. And so they said, oh, it's called Amagao, Amagao, Macau. <laughs> right? That's how it got its name. So uh, there you find, uh, if you go to this beautiful place, a uh, very, you know, uh, very, a uh, lot of people there at all times, right on the, right on the shore, right on the, uh, on the harbor. And there are symbols of Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism. And people in Macau said, all of these religions live happily together in the Amman Temple. Well, you don't find that. You don't find that in Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Dante's idea of limbo, we've talked a little bit about this already. I've told you limbus, from the Latin word limbus, meaning hem or border. For medieval theologians, limbo was a place on the outskirts of hell reserved for two groups of people. The virtuous persons of the Old Testament, unbaptized infants. To these two categories, Dante daringly adds the souls of the good and wise people of the non-Christian world. So that's really not orthodox Christianity. It's something that he has put into his poem uh, on his own. So in Limbo, the theologians thought the pains of hell would be lesser. Augustine thought that they would be lesser, or later, Abelard in the High Middle Ages, they would be absent. So it's in hell, but it's not as bad as being in real hell. Dante's treatment of the virtuous pagans is often seen as evidence for his humanism, right? The idea that uh, the, the culture of ancient Greece and Rome was uh, to be admired. Of course, Dante was not a humanist like the hero of Marlowe's Dr. Faustus, who says, this word damnation terrifies not me, for I confound hell with Elysium. My ghost be with the old philosopher's famous passage from Dr. Faustus. And what he's saying is, you know, I would prefer to be down there with Plato and Aristotle 
uh, than up in the Christian heaven singing hymns with the angels. Uh, that's a true humanist, right? That's a true, uh, it's not really Marlowe that says that, it's his character, Faustus. The harrowing of hell, talk briefly about this, a little more detail, refers to the Christian belief that Christ, following his death, descended into hell and rescued the prophets, those uh, writers uh, of the Old Testament who prophesied, who forecast the birth of Christ, and other virtuous souls like Adam and like Moses uh, from uh, their captivity in hell. These souls, it was thought, had implicit faith. They, without being able to specify, they had a kind of understanding of the coming of Christ, and therefore they could be received into the Christian heaven. The harrowing actually means robbing or plundering, you know, taking out, taking away something, the harrowing of hell. The biblical basis from the doc for the doctrine comes in the uh, New Testament, 1 Peter. Uh, he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Very kind of mysterious uh, uh, statement in uh, one of the Ephesus. Also the Apostles' Creed. A creed is a short statement of belief from the Latin credo, I believe. He was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again. I remember reciting that in church and thinking to myself, he descended into hell. What's that about? You know, I had no idea. But the idea is, after the death of Christ, he goes down to hell, takes the good people out. There was a uh, text, really composed in the 4th century, not accepted today as part of the Bible, therefore it's called apocryphal, not accepted as genuine, called the Gospel of Nicodemus. And that is a very detailed account of the harrowing of hell. But in the Middle Ages, it was thought to be an authentic text. And it was very influential. There are many, many medieval texts that deal with this subject, or allude to, make reference to, uh, the subject of the harrowing of hell. There is a uh, early medieval depiction. You can see Christ. His crown of thorns is turned into a nimbus, a kind of halo showing uh, his holy status. The cross on which he's crucified, he was crucified, is turned into kind of a battle standard. He's holding it in his hand. And there you see hell, and the, uh, that's Adam, of course, and that's Eve, and then all the others behind it. He's helping them out, and the doors, the, the, uh, the gateway of hell has been smashed and Christ is uh, rescuing uh, the virtuous souls. There's a later, sort of more realistic uh, interpretation. Uh, and again, uh, the uh, hell there is, is more like, like Dante's idea of the gateway. And down here there are some uh, devils that are being crushed. And, uh, and uh, that again is Adam coming out. This is a manuscript illumination of the scene in Dante's Limbo. And uh, it, it's like a cartoon. This is where he, remember, he passes out. And then this a little later. Otherwise, you wonder, who is this person lying here? But that's Dante, you know, after he's been knocked out. Then when he wakes up, here he is with Virgil. This is Virgil, this is Dante. And here is Homer, Horace, Ovid, Luke. And you can see it. You know, the physical stature corresponds to their, their greatness as a poet. And so Homer, and, he, and he's got his sword. And, and, and poor Luke, you know, he looks like a, like a midget, you know. He's, his, his literary status is it's not as high as Virgil's. And then there's the castle with the seven walls. And uh, kind of a nice... Uh, nice uh, this is Giovanni di Paolo. Uh, one of the most uh, accomplished illuminators. If you go to that website that I gave you uh, on the first PowerPoint, you can see all of these and, and many, many others. Almost every, every uh, major episode, there are several, uh, several uh, illuminations that you can see of it. it makes it. Uh, those are the souls. Well, that's the I'm thinking about that because two of them are naked 
and three of them are clothed. And I'm kind of worried. You know, it looks like the illuminator couldn't decide. I mean, one of the things I'm going to point out in this paper is that, you know, being naked is a kind of punishment. I mean, think of the uh, Guantanamo and so forth. I mean, you know, that's one of the things that you do when you've got somebody you want to you want to torture, you, make, you, you take their clothes off, you know, you, humiliation of being naked in the presence of people that are clothed. And so I can't, you know, obviously they're not naked, right? But then the, when these are just ordinary, like inhabitants of limbo, it's like the illustrator couldn't decide. He was thinking, geez, you know, how can I paint them with clothes because, you know, they're, they're souls in the afterlife. Where did they get clothes? And then, but then he thinks, you know, I don't want to make them all naked either. So he makes two of them naked and three of them clothed. Like you can't decide whether they should be one or the other. The situation of the virtuous souls in limbo. Um, this is the situation of what's called the exalted castle. The castle of, uh, of uh, reason, sometimes called by the commentators. It corresponds to Virgil's Elysium, right? This was the best place that people who lived before Christ could imagine living in after death. So in a sense, Dante gives them exactly what they had hoped to have, right? He gives them Elysium. The only, the only problem is they don't get the Christian heaven. But then how could they get something that they couldn't even imagine? So in a sense, uh, you know, they get what they had hoped to get. Uh, they're not punished. Uh, they have the most pleasant activities. Uh, they're there with their comrades and their colleagues. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, the, their only fault is that they now know there's something better. So they have dissatisfaction. 